Hi everyone, welcome to our HP Color 3D printing webinar. My name is Sarah Utsugi with Saratech and I'm your host today. We have a special guest from HP, Dustin Klemkin, who will be sharing with us the technology behind these amazing HP 3D printers. Dustin will also highlight a few case studies of customers who use 3D printing to speed up development and cut production costs. Here's our agenda for the next 30 minutes or so. Please feel free to enter any questions or comments you may have in the chat box on your GoToWebinar control panel at any time during the presentation. We will address them in the Q&A portion of the webcast. Also, at the end of the webinar, there is a short five-minute survey. It would take you less than a minute to complete, and we would really appreciate your feedback. In fact, we'll send you the HP MJF technical white paper as a bonus just for sharing your thoughts. Now I want to tell you a little bit about Saratech. As an engineering organization, Saratech has been helping customers optimize their design, analysis, and manufacturing process since 2002. With over 90 dedicated professionals, over half of which are engineers, we earn the trust of our customers by delivering results and building resilient relationships. Headquartered in Orange County, California, our team is located throughout the United States to best support our customers across the country. Now, I would like to pass the presentation over to Dustin. Great, good morning, everyone. My name is Dustin Klemkin. I'm an application engineer with uh, HP 3D Printing. Hope you guys are all doing very well this morning. Um, and I am really excited to talk about some of the color science that we have going on with some of our color printers here today. Um, so let's jump right into it. So really what we're gonna be talking about today because I get a lot of questions about the 3D printing color workflow. How does it work? What does it mean? What do I need to remember when I'm designing a part? And specifically for color, what do I need to do? Because there are some big differences between, say, white parts or monochrome parts and colored parts. So that's what we're going to get into a little bit today, some of the science as to what's going on in our printer. And then we'll also go through and highlight some applications of what you can potentially do with this printer. So before I can talk about color, I first need to step back into uh, what you guys might remember is uh, maybe your, your ninth or 10th grade astronomy class. You guys have probably learned about color and color science, and I'm sure all of you guys are experts here in the room about it. But just in case you don't quite remember everything, I thought I'd just kind of briefly highlight how it works. So if we think about color, what is actually happening? Well, for us to perceive color as humans, you need an energy source like the sun or some kind of light source that will emit different types of waves. And you also need an eye and an object for that wavelength to either bounce or absorb off of that specific object itself. So if we look at the, the, the light spectrum here, basically what we're talking about is energy and different levels of energy. If you have short waves of energy, you're talking gamma rays. And if you're talking longer waves, you're talking radar waves. And somewhere right in the middle is the colors that we can actually perceive as an eye. So to give you an understanding of how color actually works, let's say you have a green apple. Well, what makes it green? Well, what's actually happening when you have a green apple is you have energy sources that are going and hitting that apple, and the apple is, a, is absorbing all those different colors except for that specific green color. So that green color actually bounces off of that apple and back into your eye, and we perceive it as something is green. Versus if we see something that's black, for example, maybe like your computer monitor, what black actually is is an, is an absence of color. So that particular object actually absorbs all the colors that we see in the color visible light spectrum, and we perceive that color as black. Now, when we talk about white, for example, it's actually bouncing off all those different colors and not absorbing anything. So hopefully that gives you a rough idea as to what color science actually is and how it actually works. And I'll be coming back to that here shortly. Now, if we move on to the uh, next slide here, the next question that comes up is, OK, Dustin, that's kind of cool, but how does multi-jet fusion work? Well, at its basics, it's basically a four-step process, which is fairly simple. So we start by laying down a thin coating of material that's usually about 80 microns thick of powder. 
Then we leverage the technology that we've been developing in our 2D world with uh, printers, 2D printers, and we've developed um, something called agents or liquid agents. We have both a fusing agent and a detailing agent, and we apply that into the print area onto the powder itself. Then we expose it to some energy, which then literally fuses the particles together, and then you start the process over again. So with the two different types of agents that we have in step two here, the, the black that we have here is a fusing agent. And what the, the black fusing agent does is it absorbs that energy in the way of either infrared or actual thermal heat energy to literally fuse the particles together. But to get a nice crisp or smooth surface, we don't want certain particles to actually fuse together. So we developed what we call a detailing agent, which goes around the exterior surface of the part to prevent fusing from happening. So it stops that process. So that's the basic workflow. And just to keep in mind, um, if you want to dig in deeper and see some more videos about this, we do have quite a bit of information on our YouTube channel. So definitely worth checking out. So this is the process of how it works when we talk about our 4200 and 5200 printing devices that we have today. But when we're dealing with color, we have to do with something a little bit different. So if we go back to color, as I was talking about earlier, um, and we relate it to the printing process that I just described. So with that process, the fusing agent that we developed worked really, really well. And since we didn't care about color, what we really wanted the fusing agent to do is to absorb energy. And by doing that, we can more easily fuse particulates or particles together. So we didn't care if it was energy in the visible light spectrum or an infrared spectrum. We wanted to absorb as much energy as possible to fuse those particles together. But when you are dealing with color printed parts, that doesn't work out very well. So if you think about printing um, a piece of paper in color, what is that color printing on? Well, that color image that you print is printing on a white background. And I'll, I'll get into some differences of what that means, but uh, a little bit later when it regards the eye. But by having that white background and having a consistent white background, you can kind of better calibrate and tune those colors to get a vibrant image for what you wanted. So we wanted to do the same thing here. Um, with our 3D printing technology. So what we what we actually did is we said, okay, let's have a white background of being our white powder and then apply our colors on top of that to give an actual color printed part. But to do that, we couldn't use the same fusing agent. And the reason why is the fusing agent, when it's absor absorbing all the visible light spectrum, that's why you get those gray or black looking parts that you, some of you in the audience may have seen. Well, that doesn't work because you can't really apply color and get really vibrant colored parts that way. So what we did is we went to, back to the drawing board in R&D. We said, R&D, we need you to develop a fusing agent which will absorb energy in the infrared spectrum, infrared light spectrum, so that we can fuse the parts, but we don't want it to absorb energy in the visible light spectrum so that we can apply color. So it took a lot of work, but we were able to come up with what we call a bright fusing agent and as I mentioned, it will prevent uh, the visible light spectrum from being absorbed so that we have that white background or that white powder, and then we can apply color on top of that. So moving forward, what that actually means is with our actual color printers, we have different color agents, which is, we're leveraging a lot of our 2D printing experience that we've been developing for 30 years. And we have different agents. So we still have our fusing agent. We still have our detailing agent because we still need to be able to fuse parts together and create parts. But then we also have that bright fusing agent in order to enable that color property. So if you want to think about in practicality what that actually means and how that actually works, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to visualize what that actually means. So to give you an example, um, let's say we have this part that I have here on the left-hand side. So if we talk about our 4200 series machine today, which some of you may already have today, or you've already seen some parts like that, the way it actually works is if you were to take a cross section of this part and actually look at what's happening during the fusing process. So you lay down your fusing agent on the exterior of your part or throughout the middle of your part, 
and you apply some energy and that will actually fuse the part together. Of course, we also have detailing agent on the exterior to prevent that fusing, but that's the basic process. If we jump to white parts, which are on our 580 and 540 printers, and we're looking again really closely at what's going on at one of the edges of the parts, we would have our fusing agent. And then on that exterior, we would have also our bright fusing agent so that again, we don't want it to absorb all the colors. We want it to reflect it and create kind of that, that white sheet of paper. From there, we apply some energy and it fuses together and you have your white parts. Great. So then to do color, if we're looking at our 580 printers, in that case, we would have, again, our fusing agent. We'd have our bright fusing agent to create that white type background. And then we would apply whatever color we want on top of that and apply some energy to fuse it all together. So that's kind of a simple way to think about the science of actually what's happening. Now to go a little bit further, as some of you in the crowd probably already know, color gets really, really complex really, really quickly. Um, and that's mainly because of how we perceive colors in our eyes versus how we perceive it on the screen versus how we perceive it in the real world. So for example, with parts that you see in the real world today, you're looking at CMY or CMYK colors. And really that's a subtractive process like I was talking about earlier. So you have light coming from a sun, for example, or maybe a light bulb in your room, and it's sending energy at a specific object. And that object is going to absorb specific color white spect or specific color spectrums and reflect only one color back at you. So like that color apple scenario I was talking about earlier, that apple is absorbing all those different colors in the possible visible light spectrum and only reflecting back that green color. So because of that, if you think about it, it's subtracting away all the color possibilities and absorbing it into the part. So that this is why CMY colors are a subtractive process. If you think about colors on your computer screen, one co question I ask is, if you don't have your computer screen turned on, what color is it? Well, everyone's gonna say it's black. Yes, because there are, is no energy being shot out from it. If you think about your color, your, your computer screen, it is an additive process because you have to add energy and you have to add color in order to enable those different colors. So um, the, the different wavelengths that you can add, the more that you add, you can get to, to the white color wavelength that we perceive it to be. So because of that, colors on your screen are an RGB. It, it's a slightly different coloring process because you're adding color rather than subtracting color. Now, on top of that, color appearances can really change a lot, as I'm sure many of you guys know if you work in photography, depending on what kind of color background you have. So maybe you have a color background with, say, natural lighting versus fluorescent lighting. That will give a different effect, even though it's the same exact shot. Or if you have a different border around it. So you could take a picture and have a black border or a white border or a blue border and your eye will perceive those colors as being slightly different. And really, that's what a lot of magicians play around with um, if you ever watch them on the TV. On top of that, all of us as humans perceive colors as slightly different person to person. So in general, a lot of times the, the female eye tends to be able to differentiate colors um, more clearly than what males can. On top of that, there are cultural differences. Um, I'm not sure if anyone in the crowd speaks Russian, for example, but in Russia, they have about 15 different specific words for the color red. So they have a lot of different variations of the color red. So there are cultural differences on top of that. Now, the real challenge when it comes to 2D printing and 3D printing is in the workflow. So today, a lot of times parts or we'll say color images are modeled up on a computer screen. And that works in an RGB file format, which is digital. And if you guys remember, this is an additive process where you're adding colors. But when you switch from an RGB color format to a CMYK format for a, a piece of paper or a part that you actually see in the real world, that translation between the two types of colors is very challenging. 
and it doesn't always exactly map 100% correctly. Now, that is a problem that we've been specifically working on for quite a long time to make that transition from your computer screen to the real world as close as possible. And with the RGB color formats, there are about 16 million different inputs that are available. And there are a lot of different workflows out there um, to actually do this process, but this is something that we've been working on for a very long time. And that is kind of the challenge a lot of times today. Now, if we look at the actual print heads itself, what is actually going on? Now, this is something I had to kind of go back to R&D on because uh, kind of being a little bit of a, a nerd, it is something that um, I find extremely fascinating, even though I never need to think about this. So if you actually take one of our print heads and really dive into what's going on, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, there are about 84,000 different nozzles on one of these print heads, and it makes about 2 billion firing decisions per second, which that, to me, that is just incredible that we have a, a piece of hardware or software that can actually do something like that. Now, if you were to actually look at a print head itself and see what's going on, I have kind of a rough mock-up here on the right-hand side as to what's going on. So what you'll see is the, the black or the gray channel is where the actual liquid or the agent would come through. And if you see that red line, that's referring to just basically heating element. And all it does is it heats up very slightly, which then causes a bubble. And then that bubble will push the liquid out of the actual nozzle itself. And when that's happening, we're talking about a nozzle that's about a third the width of a human hair. So very, very small. And it's doing this about 2 billion times per second. So there are a lot of firing decisions and a lot of things that are going on very, very quickly. So um, to me, this is something that's really interesting. Again, it's not something you really need to think about while you're printing, which is fantastic because we've already been working on and developing this for quite a long time. Now, moving forward. So if we look at the actual color workflow, how does it work? Uh, we've been working really hard to try to make this as easy as possible because as I kind of hit on before, color and color technology and workflow is rather challenging. So if I move on to the different processes of, of how it actually works, um, uh, we have two different processes that you can go through with color. Um, you can do texture mapping or you can do face, part, or shell color mapping. So texture mapping, if you're not aware, is basically you take an image and you wrap it around a part. And there are some different pro uh, softwares out there, as I listed below here on the left side, like photo Photoshop or Maya or Blender, that can actually do that. So you could literally go on the, the internet, pull off an image, and let's say you had a sphere, you could wrap it around that sphere. Now, it doesn't always map correctly because there can be distortion depending on what kind of geometry you're trying to wrap it on. So you might need to manipulate it to get it to work correctly, but that is a possibility. The other option that works well is if you have access to the CAD image or the CAD file, you can actually segment out different features and say, OK, I want this round feature to be blue and this circle to be red and this overhang to be yellow so that you can actually assign different colors to a different face or a different section or feature of that specific part. Pretty simple. Now, moving forward, I'm just going to kind of show there are different softwares out there that are um, developing different workflows to apply this color or colors in a very easy process. And the, the video that I'm showing or beginning to load right now is showing how SOLIDWORKS has developed a workflow to apply color onto a specific feature or a specific dot design or something of that nature. So it's as simple as taking uh, some color and actually dragging it onto a specific feature or a specific section of the actual part. Now it appears that, I'm not sure if you guys are all seeing this, it looks like it's, it's not loading for whatever reason, but um, basically what it's doing is just applying those different colors in. Actually it's playing just fine, Dustin. Wonderful. Um, so um, moving forward here, um, I'm just going to do a, a quick uh, screen grab demo here of applying color in our actual um, HP SmartStream Build Manager software. 
Um, this is something that you can download straight from our website today. Um, and it is pretty easy to use. So um, if you wanted to check this out today, you can go to Google and type in HP software download. The first link that's not an advertisement, you can click on there and then type in, say, multi-jet fusion, and that will take you to the download page to download the software. Now, this software, it's really easy. If you had no instruction, you could probably learn it in about 30 minutes. Um, there are not too many buttons, but it, it's basically a pick and play software so that you can move parts around, reorient them and apply color in a, a relatively easy way. And if I just go ahead and um, looks like it's not wanting to show that. So um, the, the process is pretty simple. So there are many options depending on what your actual needs are. If, for example, you come up with some CAD model and you just want to print it, some different softwares out there that Siemens might have or Autodesk has, they're developing plugins so that you can send your CAD models straight from your design CAD software directly to your machine to print. So that kind of shortens down the workflow. Or if you're kind of coming from a graphic design process, um, when that happens, a lot of times you will probably have to pull it into one of our build managers um, just to orient the parts the way that you want it to pack parts in and then send it to the printer. So there are a lot of options out there. And that's really where if you work with Saratech, for example, they can best advise you as to what makes the most sense, depending on what your actual needs are. Um, I know for myself, I use NetFab. I use Materialized Magix. Um, I use SolidWorks, I use Autodesk. So there are a lot of options depending on what you're really looking for. So how it actually works, I'm just going to show this quick video and we'll see if it loads for you guys or not. Uh, I'm not sure if, it, if you guys are seeing this, but if I just talk through the actual workflow of how to apply colors, um, it's pretty simple. So when you import a part into SmartStream Build Manager itself, um, it is going to preserve those color features as long as you save it as like a 3MF file format or an OBJ, for example. And that will preserve those colors. But let's say you don't want to print in color. Maybe you just want to print in monochrome. Within our Build Manager software, which is pretty simple, like I said, you have that option to turn that color off if you want to or apply a new color to it. Now, it's not going to, to be able to apply color in different features of that part, but you can apply it across uniform across that part itself. Another option that you can do is, let's say you import a part with um, multiple different colors and you printed out the part and maybe it's not quite exactly the color that you were hoping to get based on what you saw on the screen compared to what you saw in the real world. Um, our software has an ability to adjust the hue or the lightness of the actual parts that you're importing into the, the SmartStream software itself. So we do have some basic capabilities when it comes to that. Same for adjusting saturation of color. So that can come in really handy so that you don't have to go back to the designer or graphic designer to maybe slightly change a color of a part. Or if you bring in a part that maybe has some file errors, Let's say it has a color gradient and a hole in it. We do have a, a basic fixing tool, which will fill those holes and preserve the color gradient or preserve the color if there is a hole there, for example. And it does a pretty good job at making those fixes for you, which is wonderful. Now, on top of that, when we're talking about color, some people want to know about, say, color matching or being able to get the color that they really, really want. So in our SmartStream software, again, we do have this capability to build what um, I'll call a chain link. So let's say your customer says, hey, um, I have this part. I want you to print it. And here are the RGB color values that I want you to print in it. Well, rather than trusting that the system is exactly going to map or get your colors to work correctly, what you can do is you can type in RGB values in our software and, and add uh, different color chain links so that you can print out this chain link in a variety of different colors and present it to the customer and say, here's the RGB value that you requested. Is that the color that you had in mind? Or is it this different RGB value, which is slightly different 
but more in line with what we thought you were looking for. So that's a good way to kind of trust but verify that the color that they're looking for is actually correct so that you don't go through this process of printing all these parts with the RGB value that they gave you only to find out that, well, you know, on, on the, the digital screen, it looks correct, but in the real world, it, it isn't quite exactly right. So that's one way that we've uh, developed to make it a little bit easier and try to take some of the guesswork out of it so that you can get to a solution for your customer um, in the fastest way possible. Great. Now, stepping forward, if I uh, move on to the next slide here, if we dive into some applications, we'll look at some color use cases here. So um, a lot of people always want to know, okay, great, you can do color. So what does that mean? Where can I use it? Um, why does it even really matter? So um, one of the big applications, as I'm sure many of you guys know, are jigs and fixtures and manufacturing aids more broadly. Um, this is a huge application in the 3D space in general. It's been around for a long time. It's usually an afterthought in manufacturing processes. They want to make something, but they don't realize that to do it consistently and repeatably, they're going to need certain tools to kind of verify that the parts that they're making are coming out with the, the, the level of accuracy and the repeatability that they desire. Now, to date, a lot of jigs and fixtures are made out of one color, and they are usually that because of what material options that you can actually get. Um, a lot of times, higher performance or engineering grade materials, you don't usually have color options. So this is a really big deal because with our uh, PA-12 material, it is a robust enough of material that you're going to be able to withstand some impacts and uh, um, have some rigidity to it. But by being able to apply color on top of it, it just makes things just a little bit more intuitive. So instead of having, say, a, a monochrome uh, jigger fixture and then have some instructions posted up right above it where they have to look at the fixture and then look at the instructions and look at the fixture, now you can apply different color features, maybe different textures to that jig and fixture to make it more intuitive. I know I've been on some manufacturing lines where um, they're adamant that certain features that won't end up on the final product have to be blue or they have to be red. And it's just a visual indicator so that people don't accidentally leave their tools inside of an engine or leave a holding fixture inside of uh, maybe a computer housing or something like that. So by being able to have that kind of consistent colors, that helps you everyone to do their job and just kind of spot check things easier. So as an example that I have here on the right hand side, you can have red to mean one thing, green to mean maybe a surface that's going to come in contact with the part that you're going to put in there. You can highlight certain uh, personal protective equipment or PPE that's required, like we have here with the, the gloves, and then maybe text in different color, um, just to better, more visually and, and um, intuitively communicate what you really want that person to do when they're using that jig or fixture. Um, also, of course, safety is a really big deal or QR codes. I know I've seen that on manufacturing lines where you can go up and scan a fixture and up on the computer screen, it will show you the instructions or a brief video of how to actually use that jigger fixture. So that, I think this is a, a pretty big deal when it comes to that. Now, I will say, um, since this is still a relatively new printer, we don't have a ton of use cases or examples yet. So. What I'm going to show you now is some use cases that I think it's going to go and that I think might be a, a really good application. So uh, another example is consumer goods. Um, so um, this comes from a company called xyzbag.com. Um, and what they do is they create purses and with some of the parts of the purses are actually manufactured in multi-jet fusion. So the, the black component, that black, black hoop on that actual bag itself is actually printed on a 4200 currently today, and then it's dyed black to look like this. But imagine if you could apply color to that and make it custom for what you want your bag to actually look like, to, to, to give it a little bit more personal flair to it. And moving forward to that same token, um, I can see a lot of applications moving into, say, mass customization applications with color, enabled via color. So an example could be lighting. 
Um, let's say the, a designer comes up with a very specific lighting fixture for maybe one, two, or say five buildings, but maybe each room has a little bit different feel or a little bit different vibe. What if you could apply color to each individual feature, or each individual fixture, according to how you want that room to feel? That gives it a more customized, a more unique feel to that specific room. Or, of course, maybe with prosthetics, where you could actually customize some kind of device when it comes to that. Um, more consumer products, you could think of phone cases, for example. So what we have here is um, uh, an, a, an image of uh, La Sagrada Familia in uh, Barcelona, Spain. I don't know if any of you have attended that, but you can see on the left-hand side, we have that building there. But imagine being able to apply color to those different features and maybe be able to add your name or different textures to it. And another application that I'm sure many of you guys are aware of if you work in prototyping is communication aids. I'm sure many of you guys have heard this, but I can't emphasize enough how valuable communication aids are. Uh, so what we have here is an image um, of a, we'll say a GIS map that was printed in color. Um, so you may may or may not have heard of the company called NiceTrails.com, but what NiceTrails will actually do is if I believe if you're subscribed to them and you have your phone and you go trekking somewhere, it will actually geolocate the route that you took to go up that mountain or something like that. And then you can buy that CAD data and then you can actually print out that map in a geographical format to show you actually what what route you took and what features you actually had to overcome in a 3D format. Now, you can obviously, of course, uh, understand that there's, of course, many military applications with this, uh, maybe working on um, the ocean floor, for example, or who knows, maybe potentially up in space or oil and gas. But having 3D communication aids that people can interact with really makes a big difference. Um, of course, more generally, you can think of things like traceability, for example. Um, let's say you have parts on a manufacturing line that you need to replace with a, a certain frequency or to be able to understand if there's some kind of failure of some part, you need to be able to map it back to the lot number of material that you were using um, by applying a QR code to specific parts. You can better store and track that information more easily, especially with a digital database. Um, prototyping, of course, um, that kind of goes without saying. Um, maybe doing FEA analysis to actually print out an FEA analysis of a part just to better understand its forces. And maybe you're communicating between R&D and engineering and marketing and you want to better come to a conclusion. That can come in really handy. But of course, visual aids, as I, I kind of alluded to um, previously, are really, really big, especially in the medical world to be able to take an actual scan of a, a DICOM or an MRI file and be able to 3D print it up to better understand what you're getting at, to be able to go in and make a certain incision or to figure out how big or small an actual area actually is can make a really, really big difference in communication, and just getting to a resolution in a faster way. So with that, um, I'm going to um, end it right here and um, I'll pass it back to Sarah to see what kind of questions we have today. Yeah, thanks Dustin. So at this time, if you've not done so, um, please enter your questions in the chat panel um, and Dustin will address them in the order they're received. But while we're waiting for questions to come in, I do want to remind everyone to please fill out our short survey when you log off of the webcast and we'll make sure to send you that white paper. So as of now, it doesn't look like there are any questions, but um, Dustin, I guess I'll ask you a few questions. Great. So yeah, how do materials perform um, between the 4200 and 5200 series? Yeah, so that is a question that comes up on occasion. So to, to give the audience a, a better understanding of kind of the direction HP is really trying to go um, when it comes to 3D printing, as many of you guys know, we are focusing on production. So we want to be able to enable everyone here to be able to do a production of parts, not just prototyping, but a whole production. And what we found is in order to enable that, you got to follow the workflow of design. So the way it usually works is you come up with some design, you do some prototyping, you go back, make some refinements to the design, make some more prototyping. Once you get from prototyping and you're ready to scale to production, you might be changing different manufacturing technologies. And when that happens, you might have to change the design slightly, and revalidate that it's going to work. 
So the idea that we're trying to go after here is to be able to do one workflow, to be able to do prototyping and production in the same technology with the same process and ideally with the same materials. So if you look at the, the color materials and our, our production materials, they are very, very close in uh, mechanical performance properties. And you can actually go to our website today and, and download the, the spec sheets so that you can better understand what the differences are. But for what we have today, um, our color parts are slightly weaker compared to our 4200 or 5200 um, series machines. So depending on how close you are to those limits, that may or may not be an issue. Good question, Sarah. Okay. So yeah, so Charles has a question. It says, does your company offer job shop services besides the sale of color 3D printers? And that was from Bill, actually. So this is Andy. I can answer that question. So uh, we do not offer 3D printing services, but we do have partners that we work with that um, do this for a living. Um, so there's a few companies that we work with that we can refer you to um, if you need that type of service. Uh, a lot of our customers, um, you know, when they are getting into 3D printing, they're not quite sure you know, if, if they want to make the large investment at first and they want to do some contract manufacturing and, and um, 3D printing, we have partners that can certainly help with that. Nice. And then yeah, Charles and, has a – sorry, go ahead, Dustin. Yeah, sir. I just wanted to add on to that, um, to, to Andy's point. Yeah, it is a really uh, valid point. Um, I, I think it does make a lot of sense to really kind of start with that. And that's where Sarah Tech can really kind of guide you on your journey to understand, is this a possibility to do in 3D printing or additive manufacturing, or is it not? And since the general additive manufacturing market is growing and expanding so quickly, um, they should be your go-to source to kind of better advise you as to what's possible and what's not, um, because there are a lot of things that you can do when it comes to post-processing um, and preparing your part for production. Thanks. Yeah, and then Charles has a few questions. He says, do you support the use of primitives in VRML? Yeah, great question. So yes, our, our Smart Stream Build Manager software, which um, I talked about today, will accept VRML, OBJ, 3MF, and STL file formats. Um, ideally, I push people towards the 3MF file formats just because they tend to be um, with less errors and also lighter in weight. So if you have that possibility, the 3MF file format works quite well. And then he also asked, do you support the full set of VRM V2, including primitives, spheres, et cetera? Yeah, so if you're looking at the specific file format, usually the VRML-2 is really what we're looking for. And then finally, he said, can you do color per vertex as well as color per shell, color per face in a mesh? Yeah, so um, color per vertex, I don't believe that is something that you can do um, that I've actually tried. Usually people aren't looking to kind of that granularity, but if you're wanting to do a specific feature or a specific face, um, or maybe you can carve out, carve out a certain section uh, or feature that you really want to assign those colors to, yeah, you certainly can do that. Great. Um, and then one final question is, what is the printer speed? Great question. So this comes up on occasion. So the example that uh, we're given, because of course you can print all different shapes and geometries and sizes of parts, but if you have a 30 cubic centimeter part, which is roughly the size of a baseball, maybe a little bit smaller, you can print 52 of those in about 18 hours. And that's from hitting start on the machine to having cooled and finished parts ready. So I'll say that one more time. If you have a 30 cubic centimeter part, you can print 52 of those in 18 hours from hitting start to having finished parts in your hand. So it is a, a relatively quick process when it comes to printing a lot of parts. Um, so to me, that's pretty exciting. Nice. Yeah, well, that looks like that's all of our questions. So 
Here um, is a schedule of our upcoming events. And of course, you can visit saratech.com for details or to register. Um, and again, this webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, please follow us on social media to get the latest information on engineering, PLM, and 3D printing technologies. Um, thank you so much, Dustin, and we will see you all in a future webcast. <laughs>